Well, hey, happy Monday morning, everyone. I hope your week is starting off well. <clears throat> you guys had a great weekend. And happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day yesterday. Uh, I'm actually filming this yesterday on Sunday evening, Easter. So, uh, but yeah, hope you guys have had a great weekend and that your week is off to a good start. Uh, so let's jump in here. We are now in week four, I think, of Apologetics Online Edition. Pretty crazy that we're still doing this, but uh, it's okay. It's all good. So um, last week we finished up our look at the Trinity in Scripture and throughout the history of the church, uh, looking at the history of our faith. And so uh, I'm glad that we got through that. <clears throat> now, uh, because I am not sure how the rest of this school year is going to end up looking, uh, I want to make sure that I at least cover and get through the things that I feel are most important for apologetics. Uh, and so the next thing on my list, uh, in no particular order, but uh, also very important for our faith, for apologetics, for you guys, uh, is the reliability and the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, which is very fitting because we just celebrated that yesterday. So I want us to start today, uh, this week, taking a look at that, and we're going to do this over at least this week and next week, and then possibly the week after, and then we'll just kind of see what happens with the school year after that. Um, but that's where I want to go, because I feel like that's really important uh, for you guys to get before uh, you graduate. <clears throat> so I have mentioned this before uh, in class. I don't remember when this was. It was before spring break sometime, and we were still together in the classroom. Uh, and I mentioned that a lot of times, uh, due to many different cultural factors and historical factors in the United States, um, religion, spirituality, these things are seen uh, as merely individualistic and private issues. Okay? And because we in America especially tend to view religion in that way, uh, we also tend to view our religious doctrines in the same way. Okay, so we tend to think of religious beliefs and doctrines as just, again, sort of individualized, internal, personal things. Okay, so, oh, cool, you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? That's great. Very cool. I'm, I'm glad that that works for you. I'm glad that you have found something that works awesome. You know, that's kind of the attitude sometimes. And what I want to share with you guys over these next couple of weeks uh, is first of all, I want to share with you why that way of looking at things is dangerous, uh, but then also that Jesus' resurrection is something that is historically provable and able to be validated, right? And our whole faith, the Christian faith, rests upon this, upon the resurrection. Okay, so again, uh, and I mentioned this, and we talked about this for a day or two uh, a couple months ago, um, but the Christian faith is not just, you know, hey, this makes me feel good. It makes me a nicer person. And, you know, I turn up to church on Sundays and, you know, I raise my hands and I feel the presence of God. Awesome. <clears throat> and that works for me. That's not really what it is. Okay. Uh, the whole thing with the Christian faith is that our faith, this faith that we have, uh, those of us that are Christians, rests upon a truth claim. Okay? So our entire faith rests upon the fact that, again, nearly 2,000 years ago, a man who was dead rose from death and walked out of his tomb. Okay? That is an objective historical fact that occurred in space and time. Right? That's what the Christian faith is about. If you don't have that, then you don't have the Christian faith. Okay, and so we're going to look at a passage of scripture today that talks about that. But I really want you guys to think through this for a second here and, and let that kind of sink in <clears throat> uh, to your thinking and into your, into your heart, right? Uh, our faith is not based on subjective internal feelings and preferences that we have. Our faith is based on an objective historical fact that in physical space and time on this earth, nearly 2,000 years ago, a man who was God walked out of a tomb. Okay, that's what our Christian faith is all about. All right, so Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, 
was explaining to them, again, that our hope is the resurrection of the body. Okay, that we are not merely just waiting to go spend eternity in heaven floating on clouds and playing harps with angels, right? That's not the hope. The hope of the Christian is that just as Jesus was raised from the dead and has a physical body, so you and I one day will be given a resurrected, glorified physical body and we'll spend eternity in that body. Now, Paul was telling the Corinthians all about this. Uh, because there were some people in the Corinthian church that were saying, hey, there's no resurrection, so your loved ones who have died, they're just dead. Sorry. Right? And Paul was trying to correct that error. So Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 through 19. He says this, And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And then here's sort of the crux of his argument. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have also perished or gone to hell. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Okay, so kind of provocative there what Paul's talking about. Uh, But again, basically his argument there to the Corinthians, and this is true for all Christians at all time, is, look, if you lose the resurrection of Jesus, if you jettison that or you don't believe in that, well, you're not a Christian. Uh, But his argument is that, look, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then our faith is completely worthless. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if he just stayed dead, then he wasn't God and he wasn't the Messiah. And you and I have committed blasphemy against God by saying that Jesus is the one God sent, uh, and we're going to hell because we've trusted in someone who can't forgive us of our sin, right? We're par- like Paul's point here is that the resurrection is this important. Jesus' resurrection is this important, okay? So we either gain everything or lose everything on this doctrine, okay? And so, of course, as Christians, we believe and we can show that Christ did indeed rise from the dead physically, just as he said he would. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. But I really wanted to uh, read Paul's words and sort of drive this provocative point home for you guys. uh, That again, the Christian faith is not just this privatized internal feeling or philosophy of life. It's based on an objective historical truth claim right? That Christ has risen from the dead. He's alive. Okay. And so because of that, again, as Paul's argument goes, Jesus's bodily physical resurrection, it's, uh, if you think of a door, you can see, yeah, right there. Anyway, the camera's all backwards. It's hard. Anyway, uh, the door right behind me with hinges on it, right? Uh, Think of the resurrection as sort of the hinge on which the door of our faith swings. If you get rid of it, you got nothing, right? It's that important, okay? It's that important. Now, a couple things about the resurrection. Uh, number one, the resurrection is the stamp of God's approval on Jesus' claims to deity and to being able to forgive sin, okay? Now, we know uh, from Scripture only God can forgive sin. Only God has the authority to forgive sin, and only God The eternal creator and author of life has power and authority over death and life, right? So when Jesus rose from death, that was, in a sense, God the Father's stamp of approval. His way of saying, yes, I am authenticating what my son has said, that he is God and that he is able to forgive you of your sins. And I'm authenticating that message by him rising from death. Does that make sense? I hope so. If not, please let me know. Um, But that's very, very important. And Paul and other writers in the New Testament talk about this, that the resurrection was God's vindication of Jesus. In other words, God putting his son on full display and saying what he has said about himself is true. The resurrection is the proof of that. Okay, 
Uh, Next, Jesus' resurrection proves that his claims are true. His claim that he is God, Lord, uh, the Messiah of the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, that he's the creator, the judge, the savior of all, the resurrection shows that these claims are true, right? We've seen uh, in class, you guys have read in the gospels that you've been doing, Jesus very clearly claimed to be God constantly. That's why they all wanted to kill him all the time, right? Now, if Jesus was not God and he was just another human being, you know, a great moral teacher, great religious philosopher, um, he wouldn't have come back from the dead, right? How many people who are merely human do you know who have been dead and then miraculously come back to life? Uh, Zero, right? Uh, Only God can rise from death, you know? And so the resurrection is also proof uh, that Jesus is who he said he was and that his claims about himself, that he is God, that he is Lord, that he is the only way to God, it proves that these things are true, that he alone has the authority to forgive sin, right? The resurrection is the proof that all of that is true. So it's God the Father's, uh, again, vindication, stamp of approval, if you will, on Jesus's message And it's proof that Jesus was telling the truth about who he is and why he came. Okay. Now, next, and we'll kind of start to land the plane here. Um, We've talked about the idea of objective truth in this class a lot this semester. We've looked at how truth is truth, whether you and I believe it or not. Right. So, you know, again, two plus two equals four, whether you believe it or not. Right. It doesn't matter. It's true because it's true, you know? And so it's the same with the resurrection, right? Either Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't. You know, he did. That's the truth, right? But there's no third option where you're like, well, I don't know. You know, maybe for you he rose. Maybe for me he didn't. That's not an option, you know? Jesus says in the Gospels, if you're not for me, you're against me, right? Uh, if, and he says in another place, If you're not against me, then you're for me, right? But there's no third option. There's no, you know, third route that we can take or that that a person can take. Either this happened or it didn't, right? Um, And so, again, this gets back to this idea, this thing of objective truth that we've been looking at. Uh, And so the point of that, and this, I guess, is getting more into my my pastoral side of preaching, is that everyone has to make a decision on this matter. You can't be neutral about Jesus, right? You either accept his claims or you reject them, but there's no third option of just neutrality. It doesn't exist. Jesus didn't leave that option for anyone, right? Constantly in the Gospels, we see him telling people, right, either follow me or don't, but there's no third option. Everyone has to make a decision uh, about Jesus. And because he rose from the dead, boom. I mean, that's it. Case closed. And so uh, that's why I believe in Jesus. His resurrection ultimately is, is the final thing that, that decides that. Like, yeah, he's true. And this is it, you know. Uh, but I want you guys to know that. And I want you to think about that and, and sort of let that, you know, ruminate in your head a little bit, right? Um, there's, there's no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. Everyone has to make a choice, a decision of faith or not, right? There, there isn't a third way, a third ground, right? It's like what C.S. Lewis said. Uh, Jesus did not leave us the option of just dismissing him as a great moral teacher or philosopher, right? Great moral teachers and philosophers don't tell you that they will die and rise from death, They don't tell you, I'm the only way to God, and if you don't come through me, you will die and perish in your sin, right? Uh, They don't claim to be able to forgive sin. That's not something that, you know, just religious teachers and and moralists do. Jesus didn't leave us that, uh, that option. Either he was lying, or he was crazy, or... He's Lord. He's telling the truth. Those are the options he gave us. C.S. Lewis outlined that, uh, and it's a brilliant, brilliant truth. Um, So obviously, uh, as a Christian, I believe Jesus is Lord and God and that he is risen from the dead, that it's true. Uh, But again, everyone has to make that decision, okay? And so anyways, all of that, this is just sort of an introduction to uh, the resurrection. So 
Uh, what I would like you guys to do is in Mere Christianity on page 60, chapter 5, called The Practical Conclusion, I'd like you to read that uh, today and tomorrow, the next couple days. Uh, and then I'll be back with you guys probably Thursday for our next video. <clears throat> and remember, your Luke 18 and 19 gospel reflection is due Friday. So God bless you guys. Uh, have a great day. I will talk to you hopefully soon. Uh, feel free to reach out via text or email. Uh, if you have any questions or need any clarification on anything. So until next time, peace out.